All right, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Yes. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Amy, Hi. this has been amazing. You sent ahead all of your contributors. So we've all had this chance <laughs> to get to know each other and share everybody's innermost secrets before you know you came in. It's amazing. Well, that's good. I mean, I know that our writers are big readers, so I thought they'd want to know about your book club. Thank you. That was very generous of you, per usual. Um, yes, I was, I was trying to recruit them to write for moms. I don't have time to write secretly, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can share. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. You, can, you keep them. They're amazing. They're so loyal. <laughs> Actually, it's been really nice to hear them all talk so much about being a part of the Chicken Soul family. Um, they all feel, um, not to speak for them since they're all right here, but just sounded like so many people feel such a sense of belonging and acceptance and safe space with the chicken soup, soup platform. So it's really amazing what you've created there and built up. Well, we owe it all to our writers. We would be nothing without them. Uh-oh. Well, I've been singing your praises about what a Wonder Woman you are to have you know, really rehabilitated this brand and gotten all these authors together and all the many, many books that you do. Um, so I was hoping you could just talk for a minute for those who might not have listened to our podcast or don't know that much about you, how you, how you took this brand and, and made it what it is now. And then I'll let everybody else jump in and ask you questions. Okay. Well, <laughs> I guess the first thing we did was really stupid. Um, <laughs> my husband and I and a bunch of friends and family all invested in probably one of the only leveraged buyouts in America done in 2008. And we bought Chicken Soup for the Soul from its founders, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, just in time for the huge recession, right? The biggest recession since the Great Depression of 1929. And so we watched borders go bankrupt. We watched, you know, bookshelf space yes. shrink at all these stores. I mean, it was, it was so hard. We just spent the first four years surviving. And then when the economy came back, then we started really building off this base. But during those difficult four years, I did kind of reorient the brand. You know, one of the easiest things I did, it was so obvious, was I stopped having the titles be chicken soup for the blah, blah soul, because that was so limiting. And by just saying chicken soup for the soul, and then whatever title we wanted, we could explore all these new topics like making me time, right? Because how could we have done that the old way? And then we completely changed the design of our books, made them very, very pretty inside. We jazzed up our covers. We were always very socially conscious as a company, so I can't say we really changed that. We just continued to be as inclusive as possible in the pages of our books. And we, uh, we just got going. I mean, it was a great legacy that I inherited from Jack and Mark. And so I ended up just doing more of the same brought the books back up to 101 stories. And if you guys aren't sure, it's really and truly uh, crowdsourced. I, I would say we were one of the first to do that, you know, buzzy word crowdsourcing and then curating. That's another buzzy word, right? So we crowdsource, we'll get thousands of submissions for each book. And then we curate like crazy, which is sometimes really painful when we have to only accept 101 stories to go in a particular book. And then we do some editing, sometimes heavy editing, sometimes very, very light. Um, the people who I see uh, from our contributor group are the people who get edited lightly, you know, because they're really wonderful writers. But sometimes we have a brand new writer who really needs some help. So I'll do a big rewrite, basically, which is fine unless they quit their day job, which has happened. Um, which is very scary when somebody says, I've quit my day job, I'm going to be a writer. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you didn't recognize the difference between what you sent in and what we published. Um, and speaking of that, we do have our contributors approve 100% 100, 100 of the edits that we make to their stories because we treat them with great respect and nobody wants to be edited against their will. So our contributors have to agree to all the edits. And, um, and then, yeah, we make our contributors part of our family. But the reason that Chicken Soup for the Soul has worked this well for, I think it's 28 years now, wow. because storytelling is what works best for people to learn from, you know, instead of dry essays with bullet points. Like, I think mankind has always shared advice and culture and wisdom through storytelling. 
And so our books are very entertaining, even though they're also very good for you. Excellent combination. <laughs> um, well, I'd love for other people in here, I'll just bring it back up for anybody who has questions for Amy about how she puts these books together or her own experience or really anything related to the chicken soup for the soul, especially this new book, Making Me Time. All right, Daphne has a question. Do you want to ask it, Daphne? I'm unmuting you. You don't have to if you don't want it, but she is. Hold on. Go ahead, Daphne. I'm curious to know how you choose the theme for each book. And I know you're probably five themes ahead because, you know, waiting for submissions, but I'm curious how you make those decisions. You know, I, I always think I'm going to run out of new ideas. Like right now, I have no idea what I'm going to do for 2022. Like the well has run dry. And I say that every single year. And then all of a sudden I'm just overflowing with ideas for the next year. And Sometimes they just seem remarkably on target for what's going on in society, even though we have to come up with the topics, you know, a good year or more ahead. Like this Making Me Time book just seems so perfect for the pandemic, right? When we're all crowded together and feel like we have less time for ourselves than normal, especially those people who have kids at home and husbands at home with them. And even the dog seems to be more intrusive, I think, right? So I think that Making Me Time was was perfectly timed for um, those of us who have lived through the pandemic and are now looking to come out of it with some lessons learned. But it just always seems to work that way. So I try to read a lot. I read so many bestsellers to see what people are thinking about, follow the news very closely. I also look at the stories that people write for us about a particular topic and I look to see, well, what sub-themes are emerging as really, really powerful and then this is what happened with Making Me Time a long time ago. I saw that when people were writing about positive thinking or empowering themselves or trying new things or whatever other themes we were asking them to write about, they would talk about self-care and making me time for themselves and decluttering their calendars and making personal spaces for themselves. And I realized that the topic Making Me Time would really work as a standalone book. And it has worked. It's been doing really, really well. It's, um, we follow the Nielsen book scan bestseller list for self-help books. And it's one of the top books on that bestseller list uh, and has been since the first week it came out. So that's what I do. I just try to be really aware of what's going on very, very, very occasionally. And I can't even think of an example right now, but once in a while we'll put a topic out there. Oh, I can think of an example. I think I could think of one. Um, we'll put a topic out there and we won't get a lot of submissions and then we'll realize well, that's not a good topic. And I remember when it happened, it was after 9-11, a few years after, and I met a therapist on a vacation in Costa Rica of all places. And she was saying to me, why isn't there chicken soup for the soul for therapists? And I said, well, there could be. And so I sent out a call out and started getting submissions for a chicken soup for the soul book for therapists. And we only got several dozen submissions. So I said, well, that's not going to work. And we decided not to do that. Usually we'll get thousands of submissions and sometimes even, you know, 4,000, 5,000. And then I'm really excited because I know that if that many people want to write about a topic, that means a lot of people are going to want to read about it also. Excellent. Can you, can you share the ones coming up? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Our next book is coming out in April. Of course, it's finished, so you can't write for it, but it's called Chicken Soup for the Soul, Be You. And I actually had put it on the schedule for last spring and pulled it when we were about to print tens of thousands of copies uh, last February because of the pandemic. And we actually didn't print it and we waited 11 months to put it out. So now it's coming out and it's all about female empowerment and affirmations and determination and it just seems to be right on target this year, just as much as it was last year. Um, Cause I do feel, feel like women have lost a little ground, especially during the pandemic with all the extra stressors put on women as kind of the people who keep things going when, when you know, times are tough. And then in May, we have a book coming out called Read, Laugh, Repeat, which is a humor book. We did a humor book last year. Oh my gosh, this was such an example of getting lucky on timing. 
We put out a book called Laughter is the Best Medicine in April, the beginning of the pandemic. It was our best-selling book last year because everybody just wanted something light so they could disappear inside some stories that would make them laugh. Uh, so we have another one coming out in May. And then in June, we have a book coming out called I'm Speaking Now, which is a book in which um, 101 Black women share their truth with stories about everything from you know light topics like going natural with the hair to really heavy topics like being terrified every time their husbands get in the car and drive to Home Depot. And the fact that their husbands have to dress up to go to Home Depot while um, the rest of us go to Home Depot looking like garbage, right? And they dress up so that they won't be you know, accused of anything or pulled over or whatever. So that's a very powerful book that's coming out in June. And then we're collecting for stories about Christmas for our 2021 Christmas book. We're collecting for stories about angels. That's one of our spiritual topics that's really popular. What else are we collecting for right now? Elder Karen Dementia. Oh, that one I'm editing right now, Elder Karen Dementia. So yeah, we have a book called Navigating Elder Care and Dementia that's coming out uh, June 22nd. And I'm actually editing it now. So all the stories have been chosen for that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't even remember all the topics we're collecting for right now. We keep changing them. And you just go to our website and you click on submit your story. And then we show you all the topics we're working on. And we have a really good set of story guidelines that I wrote to help you write a good chicken soup for the soul story. And we basically tell you not to follow the rules you learned in seventh grade English. So do you remember that whole thing about tell the reader what you're gonna tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So if you do that, I will just lop off your first paragraph and lop off your last paragraph because we just wanna jump right into the story and make it interesting. Um, so that was kind of funny because that allowed me to do what I think is good for storytelling, but also in a passive aggressive way, take revenge on my son's seventh grade English teacher because she kept giving him B on essays that I thought were really great that I had helped him with. <laughs> so, Cause he wasn't doing that. You know, he wasn't boring them to death by telling them what they were going to tell them and then telling them and then telling them what they already told them. Our readers are smart. We just go right into the story. They're gonna figure out what we're telling them and what we told them. Uh, so, so we try to be way more journalistic and we just tell the story. And, you know, I'd rather start with like, as I, you know, gripped the, the tree root, as I fell off the cliff, um, I thought about blah, 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 versus like, now I'm going to tell you a story about how adversity changed my life, you know? So anyway, we try to make our stories very, very entertaining, even though hidden inside them are some really good life lessons. Awesome. Uh, Julie has a question. Hi, Amy. Hi. I, Hi. I just wanted to tell you, I'm so excited to be reading a chicken soup book again. And I heard you on Zibby's podcast and I read them as a girl. And so coming back to it has been such a joy for me. And I was talking to my sister who's 10 years my junior and she said, oh, I love chicken soup. And it just was such a great moment. So thank you for what you've done to keep it going, but then also what you've done to revamp it. It's, it's lovely. So I appreciate it. And I agree, your story guidelines are excellent. I submitted my first one last night and I was, oh, but I was so impressed. It was clean and easy and I, it was great. So thank you. Um, I'm just curious what your curation process, process looks like, not in a self-interested way, but how do you, how do you do that to go from thousands down to 101? I mean, do you have, a, what does that look like? So we have a team of editors who have been working okay. with us for years who really understand what makes for a good chicken soup for the soul story. And we even pick which editors should read on which topics, you know, based on what we think their area of expertise will be. Okay. And so they'll read the thousands of stories that come in and every single submission is read wow. because we really care about everybody. And we also are always trying to, to bring on new writers. Like we're really sure. excited that we have dozens of new writers for us, at least, you know, in every one of our books, we're trying to cast our net as wide as possible. So they'll read the thousands of stories and then we have a grading system and I'll end up seeing 
the tens and the 9.75s. And because we're chicken soup for the soul, the lowest grade you can get is eight. So, <laughs> so that's amazing. <laughs> I know it's funny. It used to be that <laughs> if somebody didn't get in, you'd be able to say, well, you got eight out of 10. I'm so sorry, but we had all tens, you know, we had so many tens. <laughs> but um, the fact is that we get, we get way more than we can use. Uh, so I'll end up seeing the last, I'll, I'll end up seeing like a few hundred of them and then I'll go through those and narrow it down to maybe 105 or 110 and then we'll shape the manuscript from there. And I just, I, I print out all the stories, I write chapter ideas on them and then I spend hours walking around my dining room table and uh, just making piles of stories and different chapter topics and then it, it takes a long time. And then there'll be some where I'm heartbroken. I'm like, we're gonna, we have to use this story somewhere else. And so let's move it to our Christmas book or let's move it to the cat book or some other place. I'll find another place for it if I can't publish it. And we'll only say yes to maybe 102 or 103 people, you know, cause we don't want them to be disappointed. And then um, usually that means we'll get 101 because one or two people will drop off because they were so revealing in their stories that they decided at the last minute they're not going to do it after all. Although we do allow you to use a pen name uh, if you just don't want to hurt somebody's feelings by putting your name on the story. So there is that ability to tell very revealing stories and use a pen name. As long as we know who you really are, the public can right. see a pen name. And then once, you're, once we've chosen your story, you still won't know until we send you a permission form. And that's after I've made all the chapters and then we're really sure we want your story. Then you get this permission form to sign out which is pretty standard issue, except that ours is much nicer to the, our writers than most anthology publishers. Most anthology publishers pay you hardly anything, take away your rights, and don't tell you the edits they're making. We have you approve all the edits. Uh, we pay you $200 plus 10 free copies of the book. Um, and we make you part of our whole group, which means you get discounts on books. You could buy the books for half price. We do all these great things for our writers. So anyway, you fill out a permission form and then you get to see the story with our suggested edits and then you hopefully will like them. But if you don't, we negotiate back and forth. And once in a while, I just won't agree with somebody and they'll pull their story. That probably happens two, two times a year, maybe out of you know 12 books, we'll lose one story over a disagreement about the edits. Um, and then it will get published and uh, it's, Super exciting, get your box of 10 books from Simon & Schuster. And then we actually have a publicity firm that just does publicity for the contributors to our books. So as a contributor to one of our books, you get an email saying, hello, I am your publicist, which is pretty exciting that you have a publicist and will help you get publicity for your story and your inclusion in the book in your local newspaper um, or whatever other local you know, venue you have, even a local television station or local radio show. So that's what it's like to get in and then what it's like to be part of one of our books. That's so fantastic. Thank you. It is, it's so writer friendly and it's so fun to listen to you describe it because you can see that in all your expression of it. So thank you. Well, sure. And I'm glad you loved the books growing up. And I just have to tell you one thing, the pandemic has caused so many mothers and grandmothers to remember how much their kids, you know, or they depended on Chicken Soup for the Soul books during those adolescent years. And so the sales of those old classics, Chicken Soup for the Preteen Soul, which is, you know, 20 years old, and Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, which is 25 years old, sales of those books have soared since the begin beginning of the pandemic. And we're actually releasing new versions of those two books in August. We're taking out uh, some of the old stories that we think are just outdated and just not right anymore for today's kids. And then we're putting in a couple of dozen new stories in each of those books. So uh, we're really excited about refreshing those books and bringing out those classics again in August for people like you who grew up with them and now want to share them with the next generation. What a gift. That'll be really exciting. Thanks. Wait, Julie, I have to ask, the what topic yes. did you pitch? Uh, tough Times. Okay. I, yeah, that it was, was, it was perfectly right down the middle of the fairway for me. I was like, Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can I ask a question? Yes, please. 
Uh, Amy, you come out with the best quote, quotes at the beginning of each chapter. How Would you explain the process? How do you find them? And they're just exactly right on. Every one I've submitted, the quote is perfect. It would have taken me years to find that quote if I was on my own trying to do it. <laughs> well, um, our quote ninja is Diet Corona, who is our associate publisher. I love her. So she goes through and she puts quotes on and then I keep most of the quotes that she puts on. Sometimes I'm like, no, I remember there was this great one that would be perfect. And I go searching for it on the internet and then I you know, substitute the quote. But we do try really hard to have the quotes be great quotes in their own right, but also very relevant to the stories that they're at the beginning of. And we think it adds a lot of richness to the books. In the old days, before we bought the company, Chicken Soup for the Soul would put quotes at the tops of some of the stories. And I decided to just do it on 100% of the stories. Excellent. All right, next question. Yes, Lisa. Let me unmute. Uh, yeah, there we go. Hi. Hi, Amy. Um, I just had a quick question about um, how being a part of um, chicken soup has affected or changed your life um, in a different way that maybe you didn't expect when you started the whole thing. That's a really good question. So I have been tremendously changed by reading all of these stories and being part of making these books because you just can't read tens of thousands of stories from all these people who are so unselfishly sharing like their milestone moments, you know, and their most revealing, you know, inner feelings. I guess it's almost like, you know, reading case studies if you're a psychology student or something like that. And all of us on the editing team talk all the time about how we've been changed and how we are much better able to deal with adversity in our lives. And even during good times, we all have noticed how much more grounded we are, more grateful for what we have, way less judgmental than we used to be, friendlier, um, more at peace with ourselves, more willing to try new things. It's something we talk about all the time. We've all been trying new things constantly because we've realized how important that is. And I think we've all engaged in better self-care. We have better relationships with friends and family members. And then I think we've also learned some things that I would put more in the slightly bitchy category. Like, <laughs> like one of the things that we've learned, and I swear I didn't learn this until I was you know, past 50, but we've all learned this from reading the stories. And there's one from Connie Pombo in the Making Me Time book that's about this topic, which is that you get to curate your friends and sometimes you need to do a little refreshing of you know, that garden of your life and do no, some she's reading. Well, you have to, she's right there. Do you see her? I know. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay, just making sure. So the fact is that um, we've, we've even learned that, you know, some of those self-defense things, like declutter your life a little bit, um, be more assertive about sticking up for your own rights and, and only having good people in your life and not people who are toxic. But people have said to me, and I'm going to have to take it as a compliment, even though it's slightly alarming, but they'll say, you're so nice now. And then it makes me wonder, oh my gosh, what was I like before? But, <laughs> you know, but the fact is that it does really affect you. And we have people who tell us they read a chicken soup for the soul story every night before they go to bed. In fact, we have a very, a very successful man who's in his 80s, who is a great friend of our company now, works closely with us, um, hugely successful real estate entrepreneur, as well as being a wonderful doctor. And he's been reading a Chicken Soup for the Soul story every night, practically since Chicken Soup for the Soul started. And he says that it's life-changing and he wishes that everyone in America would do the same thing. And he actually created a whole education curriculum with us to get Chicken Soup for the Soul stories in front of kids because he is so passionate about the value of the stories. And I've talked to people who say, yeah, I did a 101 story pledge to myself. I picked up one of your books and I put it on my nightstand and I read one story every night for 101 days and it changed me. So 
it actually helps us to feel really good about how hard we work when we know the impact that we've had on other people, not just on ourselves. Thank you. And, and thank you to all the writers too for such a, a beautiful uh, way to affect and change lives. Um, another question? Anybody wanna raise your hand? Well, can I just jump in? Please, just jump in, me. jump in. I, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Amy, for being so inclusive in your stories. Uh, as a, a gay man, that, that uh, means a great deal to me. And also, I, I've really been knocked out. Uh, the book covers, I'm so impressed with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, my background is actually in illustration. And so I, I noticed these things. And uh, I, I love the book covers. And I was wondering how you came up with them. So I have a graphic designer who I drive crazy. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> usually... <laughs> Usually having a cover discussion involves 30 minutes of me apologizing and then 30 minutes of me saying what I want. But um, <laughs> because poor guy, sometimes we just hit it like out of the park on the first try and sometimes we'll, we'll go through 50 iterations. But I usually have a mental image of what I want. Uh, like for the Making Me Time cover, I wanted um, a coffee cup and my graphic designer was really into that concept also. So that one we both agreed on right from the start. And um, the funny thing was that we got some advice from Simon and Schuster that we shouldn't make the cover white because booksellers don't like white because it can get dirty in the stores. And we tried every other possible background color. And then we said, we're making it white and we might lose a whole store. There was one particular chain they said wouldn't order from us because of having a white cover. And we said, we're just gonna have to take that risk. And then you know what happened, we got the order anyway. But yeah. we work really hard to make the covers have high impact. And basically I evaluate all of them by putting them 10 feet away from me because the cover has to pull somebody you know, across the aisle at Barnes and Noble or Walmart. Yes. And my goal is to get them to pick up the book and then turn it over and look at the back of the book. Because right. on the back of the book, I'm going to tell them why they should buy the book. So cover design is hugely important. Um, I totally, agree with that, that um, I don't agree with you can't judge a book by its cover because the cover is, you're never going to get judged unless you have a good cover. So we yeah. work, we work really hard on the covers. Sometimes it's agonizing how many versions we go through. Right now we're agonizing over the cover for the tough times don't last, but tough people do. That cover that's coming out in the fall because I think we've had 50 versions already. And part of it was we started designing that cover while the pandemic was still roaring along and then we kept pushing the book back. And then I had this cute cover where the woman was pulling her mask off, but now then the, we heard another retailers don't want anything about the pandemic in the fourth quarter of 2021. They want to just be like this, it didn't happen, go away. So hmm. we had to get rid of that really great cover that I loved and now we have a different cover. Uh, I really think we're on cover version 50 already with that one. So yeah, sometimes they're really hard and then sometimes you just get them. Like the cover for I'm Speaking Now, the book by black women that's coming out in June. I just had this vision of women looking straight into the camera and we just have them in boxes like they're on Zoom, you know, and they're just looking straight at the camera. And it's perfect because the title is I'm Speaking Now. Um, and that one we got on the first try, so. Great. Probably averages out to about 25 versions before we get it right. Uh, thank uh, you. Well, Amy, thank you so much for joining today. And thank you so much to the contributors for joining, for sharing your stories, for connecting with everybody else and making this such a special hour. Thank you so much. Well, thank thanks you. everybody for coming along. I'm so appreciative. It's so great to see everybody. Yay. Yes. And, and if, any, if anybody's interested, I also announced today that I started the Zibby Awards. So if you have a book that you love and something funny about it, like the best design of the spine of a book or you're the best publicist or the best book cover or all these overlooked parts of books, you can go to my website and, and nominate um, something or someone that you loved, like Chicken Soup for the Soul, Making Me Time cover, oh, as we wonderful. were discussing. <laughs> so yeah. it's a,
ZibbyOwens.com. Okay, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, Amy. Thank you. Bye. Blessings to you all. <laughs>